A man cannot be in two places at the same time. That is a law of physics, isn't it? But how about the other law of evidence and your own senses? If you saw and heard a man in that impossible situation or condition, which would you believe, the law or your own eyes and ears? But the thing is impossible. So, then how about this? Welcome, armchair detective, to Tales of Murder, the channel that brings you classic and out-of-print murder mystery and crime fiction stories from authors you've never heard, spanning the golden age of mystery fiction. 1860 through the 1950s. In today's exciting episode, Big Jim Caranaugh was on the trail of a lifetime, and one that would mean he could finally buy that island in the South Seas. But can he puzzle out the few clues left behind by The Man Who Was Seven by J. Frederick Thorne A complete novelette originally published in The Black Mask August 1920, Volume 1, Number 5. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll never miss a suspense-filled story. Brought to you by Tales of Murder, for readers with time to kill. Chapter 1 On one of those fine Italian spring mornings that pass for summer in the Puget Sound country, there entered the Savoy Hotel, Seattle, a man who ordinarily would not call for specific description, but who, for the sake of this argument, we need to identify particularly. He stood out from the world about 5 feet 11 inches, weighed approximately 160 to 170 pounds, was apparently in his late 30s or early 40s, wore a neatly trimmed brown mustache and beard of the cut known as Van Dyke, spectacles with large, rimless, egg-shaped lenses, a soft black broad-brimmed hat, blue serge suit with double-breasted coat, black tie, low tan shoes, carried a lightweight gray overcoat, a black gladstone bag, and a sole leather suitcase. He walked with a slight but noticeable limp of the left leg. Relinquishing coat and bags to a bellboy, the newcomer nodded pleasantly to the clerk and registered, in a distinctly legible hand, the name Samuel Smith, without address. This done, he set his watch by that of the clerk. It was just 10.02 a.m., received his key, and followed the bellboy to room 314. Tipping the boy generously but not lavishly, he asked that the hotel valet and public stenographer be sent to him. To the one he gave a suit of clothes for pressing, to the other he dictated two short letters. Returning to the lobby, he bought a dollar's worth of cigars, asked to be directed to the Totem National Bank, glanced at his watch, and, commenting audibly upon the time, 10.48, walked out into the crowd on 2nd Avenue. Nothing remarkable or unusual about that. Nothing that does not occur. In a general way, in a thousand hotels all over the land, every day in the year. True, but wait a moment. The case is not stated yet. On that same fine Italian spring morning of the same day, in the same city of Seattle, Washington, there entered the Butler Hotel, a man who ordinarily would not call for specific description, but who, for the sake of this argument, we need to identify particularly. He stood out from the world about 5 feet 11 inches, weighed approximately 160 to 170 pounds, was apparently in his late thirties or early forties, wore a neatly trimmed brown mustache and beard of the cut known as Van Dyke, spectacles with large egg, shaped lenses, black tie, low tan shoes, blue serge suit with double-breasted coat, a soft black broad-brimmed hat, carried a lightweight gray overcoat, a black gladstone bag, and sole leather suitcase. He walked with a slight but noticeable limp of the left leg, Relinquishing coat and bags to a bellboy, the newcomer nodded pleasantly to the clerk and registered, in a distinctly legible hand, the name Samuel Smith, without address. This done, he set his watch by that of the clerk. It was just 10.02 a.m., received his key and followed the bellboy to room 264. 
Tipping the boy generously but not lavishly, he asked that the hotel valet and public stenographer be sent to him. To the one he gave a suit of clothes for pressing, to the other dictated two short letters. Returning to the lobby, he bought a dollar's worth of cigars, asked to be directed to the Totem National Bank, glanced at his watch and commented audibly upon the time, 10.48, and walked out into the crowded street. That makes it just a little more unusual, eh, what? But don't be impatient or jump at conclusions. There is more to come. On one of those fine Italian spring mornings that pass for summer in the Puget Sound country, there entered the Rainier Grand Hotel, Seattle, a man who ordinarily... Well, there's no use going through it all again in the style of one dark and stormy night in the Carpathian Mountains, a robber band gathered about their chief. To clinch the matter, a man of exactly the same appearance as described above entered at the same hour and minute, signed the same name in the same handwriting, did exactly the same things, made the same remarks, and left at the same minute not only the Savoy and Bullet, but also the Rainier. Grand, Washington, Lincoln, Seattle, and Fry Hotels. Hotel clerks are observing people, as men go, and each of them, of all seven hotels, not only stated the facts as here set down, but swore to them, with many additional and confirmatory details you have not been bothered with. Talk about your alibis. Most men are content with proving that they were at someone other place at a given time. But here was a man, if the singular pronoun be correct, who was in seven different places at the same time, with some thirty-odd reputable witnesses able to testify to the fact, if it was a fact. That sort of thing isn't an alibi. It is the fourth dimension. Chapter 2 You never would have taken Jim Karanoff for a detective. He was too obvious, entirely too big. Too big by a number of inches, both ways. To be sure, he could and had, by strenuous starvation, trained down to 280 pounds. Also, he had reached 401. Some place between these two extremes might be called normal, if Jim could be called a normal human at any time. Four inches and a half above six feet, and almost an equal distance around his equator, makes a fairly sizable man, so it is no wonder he attracted and held attention wherever he went. But for all his size, Carano was nimble of hand and foot, as well as of wit, and could catch a car or a culprit as readily as the point of a joke. His command of polyglot American was the marvel and joy of his friends. The English language could not be broken into too small or too irregular pieces to escape his power of mimicry. Had he not been the able detective he was, he would have made a rare character actor. Had he not been so good an actor, he might not have been so efficient an officer of the law. Chapter 3 The Totem National Bank of Seattle occupies a one-story building of its own, just off Pioneer Square in the older part of the city, close to the wholesale and commission firms, warehouses, and shipping interests that form the bulk of its depositors. Westward to the present shore, or wharf line, is all made ground. The lower layers of this are, or were, sawdust and slabs from the sawmills that were one of the earliest industries of the little town that was to become a great city. To this substratum was added the refuse of the growing community, until finally the casual and indeterminate merged into the planned and ordered earth and stone fill upon which paved streets in huge buildings rest. The outer and western edge of this district still is, however, in more or less of its earlier formative state, piled and planked over for much of the area between Western Avenue and Elliott Bay. Beneath these streets and their wooden structures, the rising and falling tides slosh about and the industrious Toredo lunches on fir and spruce with creosote dressing. On a certain summer Monday morning, the steamship Bertha arrived at her dock in Seattle, bringing from Alaska via Skagway a shipment of $200,000 in gold, bars, nuggets, and dust, 
consigned to the Totem National Bank. As was sometimes the custom in those days, this gold was displayed heaped up in the bank's windows to satisfy the curiosity, whet the avaricious appetite, and inspire the confidence of passers-by. This comfortable fortune was exhibited during banking hours on Tuesday and Wednesday under the jealous eyes of two guards stationed within the bank and two others at either side of the window on the street outside. There really was no danger of robbery. The heap of gold weighed over a thousand pounds, and the window was heavily and closely barred inside and out. The guards were nearly as much a part of the peep show as the gold, the additional and necessary touch to give it the proper importance in the public eye. At night, the gold was transferred from the window to the bank vault with due ceremony, lapsing there to its proper measure of importance in a bank that reckoned its resources by the million. So much for the stage setting. Now, for the first scene of the comedy drama. Chapter 4 Perhaps it had better be called Prologue, since it happened nearly a week before the arrival and display of the gold. To be exact, on the very day that the Bertha cleared from Skagway. At that time, it attracted no greater attention than any other of the many routine transactions of the Totem National, being merely the leasing of a safe deposit box, one of the largest, such as generally is used for the safekeeping of large books or other bulky records of value. The lesser gave his name as Seth C. Seeley, address, temporary, Hotel Savoy, Seattle, Permanent, Bankers Trust Company, New York, Business Dealer in Securities. In less than an hour after receiving his card of identification and key, Seeley returned with a large parcel heavily wrapped and corded, apparently of considerable weight and of a size that just fitted into and filled the box. Remarking pettishly that the Totem National should be prepared to supply its customers with more adequate accommodation, Seeley grumblingly hired the two adjoining boxes of the same size as the first and in turn filled them with similar parcels. These, like the first, he carried and put in place with his own hands despite their evident weight, roughly declining all assistance proffered by the bank's employees. Thursday morning of that week, Daniels, first assistant cashier of the Totem National, unlocked the vault to withdraw the cash necessary for the day's business and to superintend the removal of the $200,000 gold to its place in the limelight. He took one step within the battleship armored doorway, gasped, and took two steps backward, yelling for help. There were two entirely sufficient causes for the first assistant cashier's excitement. The most apparent was the body of a man lying sprawled on the vault floor, very evidently and most completely dead. The second, to Daniel's trained eyes, the almost equally obvious fact that the vault had been looted. Of the $200,000 in gold, and he did not know how much more. For reasons that all bankers will understand and sympathize with, but toward which newspaper men hold very different attitudes, the officials of the Totem National made every effort and used every means at their command to keep all news of the robbery from the public to such good effect that no suspicion of any of the happenings here related reached the newspapers until the whole incident was history. The body of the dead man added annoying complications to this hushing-up process. But the power of money is great, even when it lies fallow in banks, so no insinuation of bribe-tendering or acceptance is intended here. Far be it from me to even remotely suggest that a banker would give or a policeman take money for the suppression of the truth. The police were only too willing to keep the whole thing quiet, until they should have arrested the thief and murderer, which consummation, they assured the bank, would be a matter of only hours or days, as is the optimistic, not to say egotistic, way of policemen the world over. Whatever the views on publicity held by the board of directors of the Totem National, they were not disposed to take their loss philosophically or inactively. 
While they assured Chief Stein of the Seattle police that they had every confidence in his zeal and ability to both capture the thief or thieves and recover the stolen valuables, they also availed themselves of the additional services of the Pinkertons and the government's secret service men, latter being interested by reason of the fact that part of the loot taken was some thousands of dollars worth of revenue and excise stamps, temporarily in the care of the bank, while in transit to other points of distribution. As this indicates, the $200,000 worth of gold was not all of the treasure that was missing, the total figure reaching to over the million mark when the careful check of the vault's contents had been made. This sum was made up in addition to the gold brought by the Bertha of gold coin, banknotes and easily negotiable securities, 